Midterm campaign season is upon us already. Attack ads are coming out. Campaigns are ramping up. And in the next few months, we are going to see full scale congressional campaigning, touring, rallies, etc. And Joe Biden is a very serious liability for the Democrats. They know that with his waning popularity and with the economic crises, the border crises, the failure in Afghanistan, etc., etc., Well, Democrats stand to lose huge in 2022 when Republicans sweep the House, perhaps. Historically, this is the case. You get an Obama, there's a Tea Party. You get a Donald Trump, there's the blue wave. And now you get a Joe Biden. But this is particularly unique, this circumstance at least, because Joe Biden is particularly unpopular. But it's mostly tribalist partisanship. The big story we have for you right now is not so much that Joe Biden was booed, but that perhaps the Democrats will use Kamala Harris instead of Joe Biden as their rallying point. The problem? Well, Kamala Harris's approval rating is also relatively down. But I suppose if you've got a Kamala Harris who's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and her approval rating is a little bit higher than Joe Biden's, you're going to go with her anyway. But there's been some speculation With the conversation around Kamala Harris's importance in the midterm, some are speculating the 25th Amendment will finally rear its head and Joe Biden will be forced to step down for some reason or another, as we've all been predicting. We don't know exactly when or why or if, but a lot of people seem to think this is the case. Nancy Pelosi, of course, as you know, created this panel that could determine the abilities of the president should the 25th Amendment be invoked by Kamala Harris. And many people thought it was for Trump. This was during the Trump presidency. And she said, no, no, it's not. And then people realized, wait a minute, this one's for Joe Biden. Yeah, we didn't think Joe Biden was going to be all with it. But there's also politicking here. Some have also speculated that Joe Biden was going to be seen as tremendously unpopular when he undid many of the policies of Trump, which resulted in crises, the border policies, the economic policies. And now the economy is not doing too well. Well, someone's got to be a fall guy. So perfect. Joe Biden runs. He gets it. He's too old. Kamala Harris swoops in, saves the day. And then with a new president, perhaps they're hoping an extended or reemerging honeymoon period can help Democrats carry 2022. It's very speculative. We don't know for sure. I mean, it seems a bit out there to suggest they're going to remove Joe Biden. A lot of people are like, "Eh, Joe Biden will finish out his term. And I think that's probably the most likely thing. I think historically we can look for a Republican victory in Congress, but it remains to be seen. Election's a year away and that's an eternity. But if there's anything we can highlight as we get into this news, talking about what's going on in this country, it is Joe Biden being booed at the congressional ball game. I think this is it. I mean, the evidence is, is clear. We also have polling showing Joe Biden's not doing well. And so we can see the real world effects. We can see the failed policy. We can see the economic crisis and how it's affecting regular Americans. And it may seem silly, but Dollar Tree recently came out and said for the first time ever, things are going to cost more than one dollar. And a lot of people said, wow, the economy is not doing too well if Dollar Tree has to raise prices. But this is inflation. It's to be expected. Now, I'm not sure it's going to be Donald Trump coming 2024. Right now, we got a lot of data suggesting Ron DeSantis is in the lead. And I got to be honest, I think DeSantis does a tremendously better job than Donald Trump ever did. But we'll see. DeSantis could be a Trojan horse for the neocon establishment, or he can be a populist leader who defends freedom. That's exactly what we need. In Florida right now, he's standing up saying you can make the choices for yourself. And that's the kind of leadership we do need trusting the American people to do what's right. So will this be a Biden v. DeSantis, Biden v. Trump, Kamala versus Trump, Kamala DeSantis remains to be seen. But let's take a look at this latest news about Biden being booed at the congressional ballgame, what this means and what's happening in this country and what may happen coming up in 2022. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com, become a member and you'll get access to exclusive members only segments from the Tim Cast IRL podcast, as well as all of our other shows, which are launching very soon, like maybe even tomorrow. We've got to apply for all the podcast stuff, but we're, 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 we're there. We've got a couple episodes already done of our Paranormal Mysteries show. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. And uh, as a member, you get, act, you get an ad free experience and you support our journalism, as well as Tim Cast is forming, let's say we are at the, uh, the Cast Castle crew. 
a couple different nonprofits. One to create open source free networking technology that people can use so you can't get banned from the internet. And the other to fact check the fact checkers. That's what your membership is helping do. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Let's get down to Joe Biden being booed at the congressional ball game. The Daily Mail reports Biden is booed at congressional ball game with his domestic agenda on the brink. Manchin decries fiscal insanity as he and Cinema hold out on $3.5 trillion budget vote while the squad works to scuttle Joe's $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. I'm not going to mince words with y'all, my friends. I listened to the video. Was Joe Biden booed? Yes. Yeah, he, he, he was booed. He was also cheered. You see, we're talking about hard tribal partisanship. And of course, you can frame it as though he was booed. But I think to be fair, you have to point out the Democrats cheered for Joe Biden and the Republicans booed for him. That's surprising to anybody. You see, this is the game they play. Now, certainly I will highlight Joe Biden being booed because I think polling data shows that Joe Biden is underwater and it's pretty bad. Now, of course, Donald Trump had been underwater as well, but Donald Trump also went to, I think it was a nationals game and he was booed as well, primarily a Democrat area. But yes, Democrats disapproved of him right now. Joe Biden's disapproval is much higher than his approval. So I think it's fair to say the booing takes center stage. But it would be important to point out that there are still people cheering for this man because they do support him. Personally, I think that's kind of nuts. Now, the story basically goes on to talk about the disarray within the Democrats. They say moderate Democrat senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are still endangering his $3.5 trillion spending bill, while progressives could tank a House vote on the separate $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package in the key vote on Thursday. Manchin on Wednesday scuttled hopes of a quick deal on the, on the broader bill by issuing a fiery statement calling it fiscal insanity. And progressive members of the so-called squad in the House are threatening to kill infrastructure, which the centrists support, unless they also back Biden's broader agenda. Meanwhile, Congress has until midnight on Thursday to pass a stopgap funding bill to avoid a government shutdown with a vote scheduled in the morning on a deal announced by Chuck Schumer. Separately, lawmakers must also raise the debt ceiling to prevent the U.S. government from going into a disastrous credit default by mid-October, an issue Republicans insist that Democrats must resolve on their own in reconciliation. Nancy Pelosi appeared poised to pull the plug on Thursday's infrastructure vote with progressive members in revolt. House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn told reporters that he'd find out at the baseball game where the infrastructure vote would be delayed. As Biden entered the ballpark Wednesday night, the Republican side of the stadium greeted Biden with boos. Democrats yelled, we love Joe and build back better. His agenda slogan. Here's what I love about this. You are not getting a fair picture of the real world in Biden being booed. Our Republicans are booing the Democrats. Yeah, yeah. What else is new? Democrats are cheering for him. How do we actually get a real world fair assessment of the president. Well, independent voters are unhappy. Across the board, Joe Biden's approval rating is going a down. We have a new poll, however, which is somewhat good news in aggregate for Joe Biden from NPR, PBS Marist, showing his approval and disapproval are tied at 46 percent. But Rasmussen just put Joe Biden at minus 14. So Joe Biden's aggregate disapproval has dropped a little bit, but it's sitting at 49.4% disapproval and 453 approval. Democrats overwhelmingly support Biden. Republicans overwhelmingly disapprove. It is the independent voters that matter most. These are the voters often in swing districts. This is what Democrats need to pay attention to. But I'll tell you this. The attitude and actions of the Democrats say to me, they know they will lose the House and probably the Senate. So they are trying to ram through whatever they can while they have this power. Isn't it funny how Republicans did not do the same thing in 2016, 2017, 2018? You get the point? They didn't. Now, to be fair, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin are also blocking Democrats from bypassing the filibuster, in which case Democrats aren't getting everything they want. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out moving forward. But some speculation, as I mentioned, is that Kamala Harris will actually be the stand-in. Joe Biden is going to take the fall on all of these problems. The Democrats will come out and say, Joe Biden is clearly not capable, so we're going to help you out. You see, a new president enjoys a honeymoon period. Donald Trump is like the only one I don't think did. But even Joe Biden, 
he enters office and people are like, we approve. And I'm like, you didn't do anything. Because that's, that's what happens. People are like, I, I, I'm going to give him a chance. I'm going to approve of this. And now Joe Biden has proven he is incapable. He has reversed many policies that were good, that helped this country. And he's taken the hit for them. So maybe they'll come out and they'll say Kamala Harris will step in and hope that a new honeymoon period will mean Democrats can retain power in the midterms. The Hill reports Harris's poll numbers rise as Biden's fall. Really? Vice President Harris has rebounded in recent weeks, regaining her footing with approval ratings that now stand higher than President Biden's. Harris got off to a rocky start at the beginning of the administration, including a botched response on why she hadn't traveled to the border when she said she hadn't been to Europe either. But her allies say Harris, whose difficult start provoked questions about her ability to be a future presidential candidate for the party, has found her place in the White House. Quote, I think there's definitely a feeling that things have been smoother, said one ally. It seems like they have ironed out some of the initial wrinkles. Julian Zelizer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, said Harris has started to solidify her position and strength in the office, gaining a sense, always difficult for a VP, of what her role should be in the administration. The key will be not, the key will be how those numbers hold as policy controversies continue and politics heats up. A Gallup poll last week showed 49% approved of Harris's job as vice president, six points higher than Biden's 43% approval rating. It's a significant change for both Biden and Harris. The president fell six, six points since August and 13 points since June. Harris's current approval rating is the same as Biden's in 09 when he served as Obama's vice president. The Gallup poll conducted earlier this month also revealed that the vice president performed better than Biden with independence, a stunning revelation for a man who, has, who was catapulted to the White House because of support from that demographic. It's unclear why Harris's numbers have risen higher than Biden's in some surveys. Though Biden in the last two months has gone through the most difficult phase of his presidency so far, <laughs> it just started. It's only been seven months. Yikes, man. Come on. Biden has received bipartisan criticism related to Afghanistan and taken hits over the prolonged coronavirus pandemic. The president has also been criticized over his handling of the border and immigration, taking hits from left and right over an influx of migrants from Haiti. Harris, in contrast, has been more in the background than the foreground on the controversies, though she did win headlines for criticizing why some Haitian migrants were being treated, uh, treated by border agents. Most Democratic strategists and observers say Harris hasn't had a singular moment or two that has boosted her in the public realm. Nothing specific, said Basil Smickle, the Democratic strategist and former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party, when asked if there has been a standout moment for the vice president. He suggested the White House could actually benefit by doing more with Harris. Other strategists say Harris has benefited from Republicans setting their sights on Biden in recent weeks. They have portrayed him as weak on the border in Afghanistan. Quote, my instinct is to say that so much fire has been aimed at Biden. Harris's numbers have gone up by the sheer virtue of being out of the spotlight. She's not giving anyone fresh reason to dislike her. So her polling numbers revert to the mean with the country about evenly divided on the black woman in the number two spot and Indian. Don't forget, she has Asian ancestry. That's according to Christy Zetzer. But Harris has appeared to settle into a more of a role into more of a role as vice presidency. Last week, she hosted the leaders of Zambia, Ghana and India separately on Wednesday. She hosted a meeting with five Latino small business leaders. Harris has been increasingly active politically, too, giving a forceful speech for California Governor Gavin Newsom, fundraising for Virginia Democratic gubernatorial candidate Terry McAuliffe, and attending an event at George Mason University. Okay, so we get it. They are seemingly pulling a Biden on Harris, meaning when Biden was campaigning in 2020, what did they do? They, they put a lid on it. They called the lid. And, Sorry, no press. Biden's going to be sleeping in his basement hoping that no press was the best option because you can't make people angry or give the Republicans anything to use if we hide. And now Kamala Harris is doing just that. Again, I don't necessarily think Kamala Harris will take over as president in the short term. I do think the Democrats are certainly lining things up, which could suggest it as a possibility. From The Hill, Democrats see Harris as major player in midterms. Democrats expect Vice President Harris to be a major player in revving up the party's liberal base ahead of next year's midterm elections. Democrats see Harris as uniquely positioned to drive up turnout among young people and women who they believe will be critical to Democrats retaining their majorities in Congress. 
Historical trends suggest that Republicans have an edge in the midterm elections, and Democrats say a strong turnout will be key for the party to keep power. She is very popular with the base. She is particularly strong with women and young people. Turnout for young people is going to be critical for the midterms, and it is uncertain, uncertain, said Celinda Lake, a Democratic pollster who advised Biden's campaign. Between turnout and swing independent women, I would think she would be quite aggressive because of her own appeal and popularity. I do not think the words popularity and Kamala Harris belong in the same sentence, but sure, I guess. I mean, look, 49% ain't the majority. It's the plurality. But I will tell you, will the, I, I will say, will the Democrats win? Yeah, maybe. Historical precedent says that the Republicans should sweep in the midterms and take back the House and maybe even the Senate. But one thing you need to consider is universal mail-in voting. And this is something I have been absolutely trying to drive home to all of you for some time, because a lot of people are, are yelling fraud when we should be yelling rule manipulation. This is the important point for those who haven't heard me say it. And if you've heard it, just I for, you know forgive me, but it bears repeating. Two Democratic activists are dispatched into downtown Los Angeles. Their goal is to advocate for the Democratic candidate as much as possible. Let's say a swing district. Let's say it's a swing suburban and urban district. So they go down to a large apartment complex with 100 units and they go knocking on doors. And each of these units has maybe two or three voters, maybe someone who's you know older than 18 living with their parents and then the two parents who can vote. So maybe three votes per unit, maybe two. So they're looking at 200 to 300 votes in one building they can advocate for. And with universal mail-in voting, they need only knock on the door and say, see that thing right there, fill it out, send it back. In fact, if you just put it in your mailbox, the mailman will take it for you. Throw it in the box and bring it, bring it out. Super easy to do. Okay, I can understand that argument. Nothing about the Republicans in suburbs and in rural areas. How many square miles to get the same amount of votes? You might actually be able to cover, what, like 20 houses and maybe get, you know, 40 to 60 votes walking down the same distance as somebody, you're going to need a car. So in the city, universal mail-in voting gives a massive advantage to Democrats. These are the things you need to pay attention to. Obviously, I think we should take any accusations of fraud seriously, but I think the bigger issue is Democrats and even neocon Republicans have helped change the rules to make it substantially easier for organizations to advocate for the vote. This means rural areas and, and, and rural and suburban areas have a harder time rallying people because of the how, how separated the population is relative to cities. Keep that in mind. That is the game. But what you can do, Republicans do have a chance if they start the ground game now. Republicans need to be sending people out to go knocking on doors, especially in blue areas like deep blue. I'm saying Baltimore blue. If you don't advocate, shake hands, meet people, be nice, work in the community, they won't know or care about you. This is how you win hearts and minds. Democrats know this. It's also why the Democrats fear Scott Pressler. You may be familiar with Scott. He goes around registering people to vote. One of the most effective ground activists for the Republicans probably ever. He also cleans up cities, cleans up trash. Now that is a good dude. You could disagree with him politically, but saying, I want to help this community and fix things, and I'm going to go knock on doors and get people to vote. That's how you do it. So you know what the Republicans need? They need a thousand more Scott Presslers cleaning up trash, working in the communities, advocating for what they believe in and why they believe in it, and then registering people to vote. But you've got what? One Scott Pressler? It ain't enough. The Democrats have activists up the wazoo. They are everywhere knocking on doors. I know these organizations. They're well funded. Act Blue is how Democrats raise money. It's an online portal. Win Red is how Republicans do it. Yet Republicans didn't even have that infrastructure. I think it was a couple years after. So they're not even fundraising properly. Y'all need some young, fresh ideas. Otherwise, Democrats going to beat you on that ground game. I've heard the arguments. People say, oh, but because of fraud, I won't vote. Yo, that's demoralizing. You cannot be demoralized. We are in a psychological war, a cold civil war. Now more than ever, you need to stand up and say, I will give it my all no matter what. But there are powerful interests that want you to believe 
you can't win an election. Donald Trump won 2016. Come on. He won in 2016. A Republican won in Miami in 2020. Okay, you need to understand you can win. Now, I hear you when you say Republicans aren't the answer. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I agree with that. I'm not convinced Republicans will save the day. But this is where we get into the primaries, Republican primaries for Congress and for the Senate. This is it. Sean Parnell, for instance, I don't think uh, and with all due respect, Sean Parnell is going to be this revolutionary leader who's going to, you know, just upset and change everything. I certainly think as far as the establishment goes, a guy like Sean Parnell is going to be working on behalf of the people and actually working towards the solutions to the problems we are talking about. Mitch McConnell has no idea what's going on. Lindsey Graham has no idea what's going on. You got to get you got to get those people out of there. Okay, they need to be primaried and you need someone who's going to say, I listen to my constituents. Here are the issues they're concerned about. These are the issues I will focus on. So a Sean Parnell is infinitely better than any establishment Republican or neocon. As for congressional races, you got to go to the primaries, my friends. Focus on the primary. Make sure the national populists, the, the, the people who are there to represent the working class are the ones who win and not the elites, the cronies, the well funded, none of that establishment trash. You've got a bunch of Republicans who are nothing but establishment crony garbage. They're all for the uniparty. They defend Democrats. We don't need none of that. Compromise would be good. But I'll tell you, I think we'd be better off with honest left and right wing populists in Congress than these establishment trash Democrats and Republicans. That means any true victory will not be a party line victory, but it will be an ideological one, be it Democrat or Republican. And I'll say it, too, if you happen to be a leftist or know any who are running, Get the leftist populists to win these primaries. I'm not talking about AOC. I'm talking about people like Rashida Tlaib. Absolutely, I disagree with her. But boy, does she refuse to back down. And I can respect that. I have more respect for her than than a lot of Republicans. Because even when they're like, you better get party line, Rashida's like, nope, don't care. I'm voting for what I believe in. And I'm like, bravo. I really disagree with her. But you're allowed to believe things I don't agree with. You're allowed to disagree with me. And I, in, I have infinitely more respect for someone who I think is wrong, who is showing me they believe what they are saying. Is she perfect? No. Does she do things wrong? Probably. Has she shown signs of being hypocritical? Oh, of course. And many, and many politicians have, for sure. But I'm looking at AOC. And they were doing this vote on funding the Iron Dome. And Nancy Pelosi comes over to the squad and waves her arms and rants. And then AOC changes her vote from against the Iron Dome to present. Rashida Tlaib and other members of the squad say, no, we're against it. We're not supporting it. And I'm like, okay, I disagree, but I respect it 100%. I would rather have actual voices arguing about what they support and don't than the duplicitous liars, the Nancy Pelosi's, the Chuck Schumer's, the Lindsey Graham's, the Mitch McConnell's. (laughs) I'll tell you this, I would infinitely more support a Mises caucus victory in Congress, but We'll see how that plays out. I, I'll tell you this. I think we absolutely need to see a Mises Caucus libertarian congressional rep win. That's the kind of ground game y'all need. But a lot of people are convinced, oh, no, it's, all, it's going to be Democrat or Republican. Well, then we're, we're screwed, aren't we? Look, getting a couple libertarians in Congress means compromise must occur. And the libertarians do not agree with the Republicans and they do not agree with the Democrats. They're a mix of both in a lot of different ways. Now, the traditional libertarian party is a bit too woke for my tastes, but the Mises caucus seems to be pretty good. So I think we we need to get a couple of those guys into Congress. However we do it, find a good district, vote for them. That's 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 a good plan. I guess the problem is Mises caucus voters are more likely to vote Republican and it could split the vote. Thus, first past the post voting doesn't work all that well. So I I don't know what to tell you and who you should vote for. I'm not a fan of the Republican Party. I think if we get active in the primaries, we pay attention, we can make a big difference in 2022. Now, I've often said that the Republican is done. It's been destroyed. It can be strengthened. It can be reinvigorated. It can be reborn. The reason I say it's, it's gone is because the way in which this, this, this country is, is being run is just insane. Rule by edict at the state level and the federal level. Antifa burning down buildings, billions of dollars in damage. If we're going to make a change, what we need is something outside of the establishment uniparty. In 2016, 17, 18, we had these neocon Republican establishment dominating Congress. And what did they do? Nothing. They they joined Democrats in the Russiagate garbage. 
get rid of those guys. What we really need are populists. You know, I had Steve Bannon on Tim Cast IRL. Steve Bannon, of all people, and he claims he's far right. But then he says, tax the rich. And I'm like, Steve, that's not far right. The far right is described as either ultra traditionalist or laissez faire capitalist. Tax the rich, that's leftist. And he's like, oh, I don't know, I'm a populist. That's right. Steve Bannon isn't far right. He's not far left. He's a populist. And so he's fairly moderate. One of the most amazing things in that conversation were people commenting, saying the media portrayed this man as crazy, but he's actually very smart and reasonable. That's amazing. We've had him a couple times. What's fascinating to me is I didn't realize how many people watch my show did not ever actually hear a word out of Bannon's mouth. I've listened to Bannon before. I've seen his speeches. I've seen his rallies. I've seen his show. Not a crazy guy. He's a populist. He says, you're getting ripped off. The rich people are extracting from the system. We got to tax them. And I'm like, I agree. I would love to see like a Michael Malice, Steve Bannon conversation because I think they would disagree in, in that capacity. As for taxing the rich, I'll, 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 say, I'll say this. Why are we taking most of the money from the working class and the poor when Bezos is standing right there? I'm all for free enterprise and everything. I have no problem with a high marginal tax rate, and I don't understand why conservatives or, or, or Trump supporters would be all that worried about a high marginal tax rate. I mean, we should lower the taxes in the middle class and the working class. And personally, I think raise the taxes on the rich. It would negatively impact me. I don't care. I think it would more so negatively impact people like Bezos and Zuckerberg, who use their wealth to manipulate this country at the detriment to the working class. But that's the thing. I'm not a laissez-faire free market, free market capitalist, but they want to claim that I'm far right. Why? To erase those who are. Now, look. The problem with taxing the rich is that you're just giving the money from one powerful centralized authority to another. Giving the government money doesn't mean anything good's going to happen with it. Giving the authority of the government doesn't mean anything good's going to happen to it. But I'll tell you, if we were being honest, we had honest popul- uh, uh, politicians. And they said, look, we want to actually pass bills that help the American people and use gov- tax revenue to create a subscription service for the American people to provide border security, better roads, clean drinking water, education, I'd say, okay, then cut the taxes on the working class, increase the taxes on the wealthy. That doesn't mean you, re- you remove taxes from poor and, and tax the wealthy at 90%. It means you tax poorer people at 20% instead of 35. Or actually, I think, you know, it's like 27. So you lower that down. And then you raise the taxes on the wealthier by a small bit in key areas, perhaps in capital gains, perhaps an income tax bracket over 5 million, then 15 million, then 50 million. And so we are going to be, you know, taxing them more. I don't think taxing outright solves the problem. I will say, though, there are substantially more working class people in this country than millionaires and billionaires. And we have a country where millionaires and billionaires are our politicians for the most part. AOC may not be, but AOC represents the social millionaires, 12 million followers. She just says whatever seems popular and it gives her power and gives her access. And she goes, she doesn't need cash when they invite her to a $30,000 dinner with celebrities who don't have to wear masks while the help does. She's an elitist. Our leaders are not here to help the followers. They're here to extract and sacrifice them. There is the herd of sheep. And they are but happily grazing in the fields. And for the longest time, there'd be the shepherd. And he would say, I will do what I must to guide these sheep to keep them safe. And sometimes they might not like it. My border collie will run around scaring the sheep, but will corral them into safety in this perimeter area so they will survive and be safer. It's not always perfect. Leaders are supposed to be leading to protect those who follow them. Today, it is the wolves who are in charge of the herd, the, the flock or the herd, whatever. It's a herd of sheep. I think it's a herd. And so instead of saying, we're going to guide the sheep to safety, they're guiding the sheep to slaughter, lining them up and saying, trust us. We know what's best. It's time we stood up and said, we're going to primary all of these people, be it Democrat or Republican, and bring in those who will actually fight for you, the working class, your rights, the freedom to run your establishment, to make choices for your, 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 to make your own medical decisions, to reject 
foreign excursion and war and the waste of our money and the sacrificing of our men and women in uniform and say, we will clean your water. We will fix your streets. We will clean. We will fix your plumbing. We will have better schools free of ideology, be it religious or otherwise. We need good and honest people running in order to do it. Unfortunately, I feel like the culture war has dominated too much of this. And even the people that, you know, on the right, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert, who resist and actively fight back against Democrats, are still very much just in line with the culture war. Come out and say you want to repeal the NFA. Say you want to repeal, you know, outright gun control and tell the authoritarians, shut up, I don't care. Because leftists are for guns. Right wing individuals are for guns. Moderates are for guns. It is the establishment that wants to take away your rights. Don't let them stand up to them. And that means focus on these upcoming primaries. Get on the ground. Go door to door. That's the game that's got to be played. Otherwise, the republic really will be lost. But, you know, they say we go through a mini civil war every two or four years. The party's fighting for control of central government, the federal government. Sooner or later, people in one state or the other aren't going to listen and aren't going to care. So we need to make sure we mend this divide to the best of our abilities, assuming it's even possible. I don't even know if it is. Otherwise, what's left? Will Kamala Harris step up and be president is the big question. I don't think so, but it's possible and people are starting to speculate. So I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up tonight at 8 p.m. over, over at youtube.com slash Thanks for hanging out and I'll see you all then.